So Sarah, thank you so much for joining me on my first episode of, of my new podcast. You're my first guest. Rude mm. advice. <laughs> no pressure, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I love what you do, obviously. You know, I was thinking, when did we first meet? Was it about a year ago? No, I haven't even been doing this a year. I started in February. Oh, wow. No. Okay. So I, I think I found you um, a, a couple months ago. And it was on TikTok and I wanted right. to do a panel, right? And you you were brought on with Brian. Uh, That's right. Yes. Uh, 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 what is what is our friend's name? Um, the, tr- the trucker guy. Oh, he recently the, got uh, Bear. The bear voice bear the or voice. something. Mm-hmm. Yep. Bear voice. And then Travis and all those guys. So, yeah. I mean, I think we've just kind of, we, we were, I found you in the manosphere, you know, kind of giving the same type of advice on gender stuff and relationship mm-hmm. dynamics. And I love what you have to say. You're a real good, you're a real good dude, Rudy. I appreciate that. Uh, I wasn't always a good dude. Uh, this is all because, you know, of my mistakes and, you know, many of them I've made and learning from them, but yes, I was the discussing the man, a man panel. And I got uh-huh. to meet a lot of those gentlemen uh, for the first time as well. So we, we've actually connected and yeah, have a few collabs as well. Travis actually got me, sent me one of his books and I'm halfway through it though. So it's a, it's a good read. And I'll we'll talk about that later. I've but, been reading his book too. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like one of those novels you can't put down. Once you yeah. start, I'm like, all right, I'm kind of hooked on this. So hey, shout out to Travis right now. A little plug there. <laughs> so tell me, sir, how did all this get started? Like uh, before TikTok. So before February, what were you doing before then? Um, living in Reno, Ta- Reno, Nevada with my brother working corporate marketing job, scrolling TikTok, uh, <laughs> for, for entertainment. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, myself, I would have to say that I'm kind of a reformed, reformed man advocate. I've also made like quite a bit of mistakes in, in my relationships mm-hmm. over the years. And I journal, I, you know, I write stuff down. I, I thought, you know what? maybe I have something to say here on this, on this TikTok thing. What if I just like recorded a video and right. see kind of how, how it goes mm-hmm. and it went viral and then a matter of a couple of days. <laughs> and I thought, what is, what is this? Like, I, I, I couldn't believe kind of the reception I was getting and it was a joke. It was satire. I mean, a lot of the stuff I do is kind of like, <clears throat> right. Tongue in cheek. Yeah. You know, tongue in cheek, mm-hmm. you know, uh, uh, sarc- Fantastic, but but I just you know I learned a lot in in my relationships and when I was looking for advice to learn about men and to understand them a little bit better, one of the things that I found was that I, I there wasn't a lot out there. I think that mm. there's a lot there's like a huge uh, resource for men to potentially learn about women because right. I don't know they, they like there's this perception that we're a bit more complicated or a bit more (laughs) dynamic, I'll say. Mm -hmm. But what I find is that men are, men might be easier to like attract initially, but to keep them, make them happy, understand them. A woman has to invest just as much time as you, you do in learning us. Mm -hmm. And I just didn't, I didn't find a, a wealth of knowledge online. And that, that kind of bothered me. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, here we go. Like, let's see. And and men have gravitated to it because I feel that they feel, you know, kind of validated. And they also have, they all, a lot of the DMs that I get are, how do you know this? How do you know this about us? Like, how are mm-hmm. you so dead on? And I'm like, I read books that are written by men. I talk to men. I, you know, mm-hmm. I get DMs. Like, I, it's really not that hard. I just don't think a lot of women are like asking the questions that right. I'm asking. Exactly. And I think that's what makes your account stand out. I mean, you, like you said, you started in February and now you're almost uh, what, 350 approaching 400,000 followers. Mm-hmm. It's a, you're a critical voice and there's not many um, creators like you that speak on that behalf. So again, I appreciate that as a man, because one thing TikTok, and I think you caught wind of this already is that it's just flooded with a bunch of just toxicity, confusion, and it can really make an impact on younger people, especially in the dating world. And that's what I've seen here. Uh, there's a lot of young men, like you said, uh, that are just heavily influenced with beauty, outer beauty. 
and they mm-hmm. think that's a woman and that's what they should get. But they really don't stop and think, okay, now you have this beautiful woman, but is she a good character? Is she a good person? And I think mm-hmm. that's one thing a lot of young men are, they're just thinking with the wrong head, to be totally honest, if I can be yep. completely honest. And then they're finding yeah. themselves in toxic situations because guess what? She's not a good person. She's hot. Yeah, she's got all the booty and everything you want, but you know, you're fighting all the time because you just don't mesh. And I think that's what leads to it. They just don't, they really don't take the time to be patient who they allow into their lives. Yeah. And I think that's a big factor into that. Um, you mentioned uh, the voice and how it, guys messaging you like, how do you know this? Does this stem from books, like you said, or maybe personal experience and mistakes you made in the past? So I would say a lot of it had to do with personal experience. Okay. And um, I, you know, my 30s was kind of, and late 20s was was full of a lot of relationship mistakes. And I, I, you know, was kind of attracting the same type of guy. And then they were, you know, it wasn't working out. And so at one point, you know, I just said, all right, like I need to do an autopsy of my relationships and I need to kind of like open up the proverbial body Mm -hmm. and dissect like what happened. So the first step for me was really kind of like taking responsibility for my part and like the types of men that I potentially was attracting or um, the type of ways that I was bringing out possibly like the worst in them. There's a an author, her name is Allison Armstrong, and she's someone that I look up to very much so. And she calls it frog farming versus Ooh, like, okay. in, instead of turning like, a like you turn a prince into a frog versus like the other way around, mm-hmm. instead of turning like a prince into a king, um, you turn a prince into a frog. And so mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of women have the tendency, myself included, had the tendency to kind of like bring out the worst in men as far as like, I couldn't let go of control, kind of emasculation, you know, criticizing them, being over, over judgmental, like not really allowing men to just kind of be and, and like make the mistakes that they need to make. I was always like very critical, but that, that went back to like my background as, okay. and, and like my upbringing and just, just some of the programming that I had to deal with and overcome um, and a lot of it was, you know, I was raised by a single mom. I was, you know, I was told, you know, my dad died and kind of left the family without a lot of uh, resources and, and, and income and anything. So uh, my whole life, I kind of was told to just kind of do your own thing, Sarah, like be independent, Wow. you know, don't depend on a man. Like yeah, that, that message that like the feminists, that's why I kind mm-hmm. of, it's like tongue in cheek now in my content is I appreciate the feminist message, but I also know why a lot of women gravitate towards that because I, I was that woman. Like mm-hmm. I was that woman who, who like needed to find that group of women that like, Oh yeah. Like these are my people, you know, like, yeah, man, you ain't shit. Like get your shit together. And there's just this like lack of bridge of understanding. And there's a, and there's like just a, a feminists are putting men down in order to right. up, up, uplift women. And, and I just noticed that I was taking on that rhetoric as well. So it's been a long journey for me, like a long journey of wow. reading books, you know, doing some serious self-evaluation. And now, now like my relationships with men are incredible. Like you and me having an amazing friendship, tons of, I have tons of, you know, friends that are acquaintances that are men that like speak right. into my life that like, that are protecting and want to help me and want to you know, just, I I see like the goodness of men, but I had to kind of, you know, lift like this veil that all men were this way or all men are that way. And like, once I lifted that, like my heart is just, is like, again, men matter. Like I'm like a huge advocate for men need support and men need to know that like, that there are women out there that do actually really appreciate them and understand them and don't want them to be like women. Gotcha. Uh, I hate to like to go with this stereotype, but they say daddy issues. Like if a girl hates men, yeah. all these things, she's got daddy issues. But mm-hmm. and I, I know I know that's like an oversimplification of the situation. Mm-hmm. But you just mentioned, you know, in your childhood, your mother said that your father had to pass, or he, you know, he wasn't around. So do you think the that missing father figure or a positive role model, male role model in your upbringing contributed to looking for that, you said that frog instead of the prince as an adult and young woman? Oh, 100%. Really? I, okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I would I viewed men as um, how do I put this? I was looking for men to men for like all the wrong things for like validation, okay. love, acceptance, you know. And I would like go after these men who typically were like addicts or you know, kind of addicted to porn or addicted to diff- anything they could have been addicted to. And like mm-hmm. my little child brain would go after these people and say like, Oh, I can, I can change them. Like I can, I'll put fix up him. with this. Yeah. I'll fix him. Cause like that makes me, that gives me value. And if he stays, that won't trigger like this primary wound that like that he'll leave. And that, that finally, like, I would have made things right in my childhood. Like finally I'm Ooh. good enough it's for him. Like he would have stayed. And, but every guy that I was attracting was like very similar to my dad who was also yeah. recovering alcoholic. Okay. <laughs> so like the pattern, I mean, you see though, how these patterns, like from a generational standpoint, like oh, yeah. continue to play out. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that intensity seeking of, of, you know, that relationship where it's, where it's like up and down and up and down and up and down that, that was like, I lived that intensity. I lived in that space. And, Mm -hmm. and now that like, I'm a fully like healed, integrated woman, human being that, that type of, um, roller coaster ride is like, I'm out. Wow. Yeah. Like I want nothing to do with it. That, that doesn't signify healthy, love and i think that people get confused with that adrenaline and that up and down and they think that dopamine that that thrill of just love and that excitement of the uncertainty of is it gonna is he gonna stay forever is he gone not knowing how long they'll be there yeah i can understand that it's confusing and it and it emulates if it emulates your childhood in the slightest you you think that that is what's representation of, of like healthy love and and it's it's not at all like healthy love and healthy relationships are like they're Mm -hmm. balanced. They're even killed. There's, there's not a lot of there's, yeah, you can have arguments and of course, like you're going to disagree on things, but it's not going to be this dopamine intense filled relationship. It's boring. It's boring. You're too good for me. All those things that you would say, right? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. And like, I like crave boring now. I'm like, (laughs) me too. (laughs) Where's, Where's the boring dude who's just standing <laughs> in the corner at the party, like looking at everyone, you know, I'm like, I'll take the introvert. There you go. Um, yeah. But I, I don't know if that answered your question. No, that did. That did. And um, I think it's, it's, I think a lot of men really, how I learned from my mistakes is really just looking in the mirror and calling myself, Hey, you are an asshole, but also putting myself in other people's shoes and listening to your story. I think a lot of young men, and men in general need to understand, like if a woman has this, you know, these types of like, maybe she, she's got dad issues. Well, think about it. Her first male role model in her life ever was not present or was a horrible figure. So everything she's learned since day one has led up to how she is now. So I think a lot of people, if they think that way, uh, it just gives perspective and empathy. And uh, there's a, a incredible lack of empathy out there when it comes to uh, understanding where people are coming from and the pain that are in. But you mentioned the veil. Like you just had enough, you had your twenties and your thirties. And then when you just took the veil off and you started seeing the world through a different perspective and started healing. Right. So Mm -hmm. what led, what had you lift the veil up? What moment, like, did you just have enough? Was it a relationship or what happened? What caused you to change? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I was engaged and I was in Texas. I was living in Houston at the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'd been in, I'd been in Houston for about eight years after school. I went there and had, had a really great time. And, and the thing with Texas though, is that, you know, if you're 30 and unmarried, like Mm -hmm. there's, there's a bit of a stigma that comes with that. Like it's very Southern yeah, and it just is what it is. So, you know, I met a really nice gentleman, um, on Bumble Mm-hmm. And we had a, you know, we had a courtship and got engaged. And um, throughout that engagement, there was just a, a, a ton of tumultuous times. Um, we fought all the time. You know, we lived together. It was the first time I'd really like lived with someone for a long period of time. Really? Okay. And um, it was just really toxic. And I didn't, I didn't realize how toxic it was until after, you know, and we, about six days before the wedding, you know, it was a big fight. 
and we we called it off like i couldn't recover from from that and Mm -hmm. he also it was just it was a big monumental thing and it was uh it was humiliating it was embarrassing i had to call you know my family my mom my brothers my brothers were ready to get on a plane and come to texas Mm -hmm. they were very very concerned and everybody was just very concerned so i had this picture perfect life you know, I was, I had a corporate America job. I was making great money. I had this Facebook picturesque life, life, right? The good, life, people, yeah. the good life. And people, mm-hmm. people would say to me like, Sarah, what, you know, what happened? Like we, we didn't had no idea that any of this was going on. And it was kind of a shock. And cause I had so much like shame. I didn't want to go with, I didn't want to go to them and say, you know, this is our, these are the types of things that are happening in my relationship. And, um, so it was that it was just this this huge like volcanic eruption in my life and typically mm-hmm. i mean when you talk to people that have gone through something they you know kind of have a period of yeah. like uh shit you know this is <laughs> yeah. this, this is bad uh i if i don't so it's like if i don't change this one thing as i i wanted deeply to be in a relationship with a loving, caring, you know, emotionally uh, mature male. And like, I just, I couldn't figure it out. And I just started to see the patterns as as they started to play out. And I, I, yeah, so like checked myself into, I, you know, just to be personal, I don't, I don't talk about this often with people um, because they wonder like, how are you so, how do you know so much about psychology? And so I checked myself into a rehab facility um, for eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And I went into like a massive kind of codependency, uh, withdrawal addiction, like just full blown, like it was a place called the Meadows in Arizona. It's a very well-known like addiction and trauma specialty, uh, Mm -hmm. place. No, no advertising for them. (laughs) Um, but I, yeah, so I went to this place and I basically, for the first time in my life, you know, dealing with like a trauma therapist and somebody who knew exactly what was happening. It was like, I finally felt heard like, Oh my God, like my life was explained right in Mm -hmm. front of me on a whiteboard. uh, And this is why I was doing all these things. And this is why everything was happening. And it was like, Oh my God, this is it. Like I'm 32 years old and I'm finally getting the answers as to like, why I, why I feel this way and why I think this right. way. And, and then it was just, I took two years off from dating as I think a lot of people should <laughs> to like mm-hmm. uh, people, people go from one relationship to the next. And I think it is so destructive because you don't get a chance to heal. And like, I healed myself like f- deeply from the inside out. And through that, I was able to, again, like see my part and what I was doing understand you know what and i continue to to do self evaluations every day of course yeah, like i've it's just it's an become, ongoing thing mm-hmm. it's an ongoing thing i've become that's the person i've become but i took time off i i read a crap ton of books and really learned a lot about myself and uh, and a lot about men and like how right. they work so that i could actually have a relationship with them and get <laughs> and like keep keep a good man and attract a good man and and be the type of person that I wanted to date. Mm-hmm. Wow. It's funny. Uh, I did not know that. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, but I went through the exact same thing. It's funny how our stories are very parallel to each other. Uh, I didn't get engaged to the previous girlfriend, but she was the most toxic woman I had in my life. And it didn't appear that way the first four months. And then she just went 80 and it just fighting every day, distancing herself from me. Later, I find out she was talking to her ex again. But it completely destroyed me. And I had to go uh, take FMLA from work. And mm-hmm. I even went to a, a facility just to check in and talk to some people and had like a, a open group of men to talk mm-hmm. about my feelings. But I took three months off. And then six months later, I found my girlfriend now who, who's now pregnant with my son. And I, at the, to be totally honest, and she knows this, I was a mess. And uh, I wasn't ready for a relationship. I was like doing little things to self-sabotage and like, I'm not ready. I'm still hurts. And she just said, look, I know there's a good man there. I see it and I'm, I'm patient with you. And she was just so different from any other woman. And mm. that's where I'm at now. But I, like you said, it takes, it really takes hitting rock bottom and going mm-hmm. through the worst possible events. Cause I know you're speaking about it, but I know it's probably one of the most painful events that you've ever had in your life. Like for example, me too, 
when it comes to being in a relationship, but to recover from that and to mm-hmm. come back a better person is a, a testament to your character. So I applaud you for doing that because a lot of people don't. They stay in that Thank sad you. place and yeah. they're just dwelling it. My God. And I see it all over TikTok and I'm like, my God, and people like support them. Like, no, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's horrible. No, I mean, you and I see it all the time where it's like, you know, and that's what happens, right? When you have these two extremes, when you have like, women, you know, ultra feminists over here, like hating men. And then you have your like men going their own way. And, and I see it for what it really is. I see it for, for, it's just deep pain. It's, it's pain. Everybody's it's, hurt. Uh, everyone's hurt. So it's mm-hmm. like F women, I'm done with women, but you know, and, and I dated a guy just recently who, um, was, was kind of, was a little bit jaded, like was kind of had that, like women have always done this, 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 and this, this to me. But then after mm-hmm. dating him for a couple months, he, um, I, I was like, okay, I understand now. Like, I understand why women do this, this, and this, because you're kind of a mess and women are pushing you away because <laughs> you're kind of toxic. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, and he was, you know, he, he did, he wasn't, re- he wasn't ready to like see and heal himself. So I had to let him go because I'm like, y- yeah, you will never, right. if you don't come to a relationship really fully, truly willing to like, look at yourself and do the, and like, if I, if I met a guy like you, who I saw was doing the work and who was like, like you said, you, you would whatever went to a 12 step or whatever group that you went mm-hmm. into. And it's like, if I saw that and if 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 people did that like there's like oh that shows like a true willingness to grow yeah. and i would abs- like your I, like your girlfriend i would be like yeah for sure like that's i'd be patient as well because that mm-hmm. shows that you're really truly like willing to work on yourself mm-hmm. but this the, going their own way is just like fine, yeah, go for and, it and i guess that leads to my my question since we both give advice you know to the dating world and you know, and you speak, speak specifically for men. I want to ask you, like, why do you think, I, I think you touched on it already, but let's let elaborate on it a little bit more. Like, why do you think there's such confusion between both men and women in the dating world? Like, why is there such, uh, I agree, like you said, there's a lot of people who are dating out there who shouldn't be. They're just going, from, like mm-hmm. you said, from one relationship to the other or sleeping with his best friend just to get even with him. And just, you know, when the breakup happens, a hey, party time, they're just out, you know, living my best life, quote unquote. But no, you're not really doing that. You're just, pretending you are or they lose weight and they look fit and they look wonderful but i bet their body looks great but i bet mentally they're a mess so Mm -hmm. i think people have the wrong uh ideas when it comes to healing and relationships why do you think there's such confusion in dating world between the two sexes i i i think it's a couple things um people aren't willing to spend time alone it's like they don't know how to to like learn how to self-soothe so put all of this weight and all this expectation and all this pressure on another person mm-hmm. to make you happy or to like fulfill these, these empty vessels within you. And it's never, that, that's a recipe for disaster. You're, you're destined to fail. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing is I think people are attracted very easily from a physical standpoint, like overtly sexualized, yeah, overtly going into a relationship, just, you know, thinking about sex versus like, like our, my, my godparents who have been married for 50 years, they started a relationship based off of friendship, Hmm. um, compatibilities, you know, seeing if they were truly a match. Did they, did they value the same things? And the only reason why I know this is because when I was going through, you know, my stuff, right. When I would, when I was checking myself in and, and figuring this, all this out, this two year period, um, I had a therapist ask me, like, so what do you value? And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. What do you What do you mean? What do I value? Like, what does that even mean? And he's like, okay, well, you know, do, do you value someone who who enjoys music? Do you Do you want to value? Like, do you value someone who wants to travel? Like, what are the things that you value in your life? And I'm like, okay, if I don't even know that at a deep level, if I don't even know what it is that I'm looking for, how on earth am I going to attract exactly. somebody who is going to fit into my universe? So it's like you meet someone and they like, you know, that you're attracted to them, you're this or that. And then like, you're trying to fit this like square peg in a round hole. And you're like, just make it like, 
just make it fit. Like just, mm-hmm. just try and do everything to make it fit and it doesn't fit. And then you're just, you're left a year and a half from now when all the chemicals and all the dopamine is, you know, run off. Mm-hmm. And then you're going, Oh, we, we have nothing in common. We don't like each other really. And we're just here. That's another reason why I think <laughs> that, that stuff's messed up. And then another reason is that people also don't have staying power nowadays. It's yeah. I, I'm not, I'm not interested in working through these things with you. I'm not interested in developing a, you know, a deep, meaningful relationship because I know that I can get back on Bumble and find yep. someone else within yep. the next couple months and everything's yep. good. And it's like, you're easily replaceable, no, easily replaceable. And, mm-hmm. and I, I hate that. I don't even, I'm not even on those apps anymore because I, I really do think that they are toxic. I, I don't think that you can, for me, I just, the level of, you're going into it with like attracting body parts. Like that's all you're seeing. That's all you're looking at is body parts. You're not, mm-hmm. there's no, you didn't meet them at church. You didn't meet them <laughs> at, at a running club where you enjoy doing the things that you want to do. Like you, you just are attracted to them because of their body parts. And like, you hope that it works out, but I just, I just don't see that for me as a, a very fulfilling way to like meet someone that I'm actually you know, equally yoked with, I don't, I hate to use a religious term, but just more so what, what I value. So I do the things now that I value and and meet people that way. But I just, I think, and then one more. <laughs> no, please. I know there's a ton of them. Go ahead. <laughs> um, and then one more, I, I really truly believe and this is the kind of stuff that we talk about right on our platform for me and you a little bit different. I, I don't think that women are allowing men to embrace their masculinity to step into this, to this frame and this leadership role. And I I think that a lot of women are, are emasculating men and men are feeling confused. I mean, I talk to men all the time where they're like, I don't even know if I can go approach a woman because what if she says that like, uh, I I didn't ask for consent and like, it's, it's so confusing for men because they're just trying to understand what to do? Like, how do I meet a woman? How do I, how do I engage a woman? Um, but you know, women, it's like, let them, let them open the freaking door for you, man. Like just let him be a man and, and don't this whole independence. It's like, I think that women are becoming kind of the worst of men and okay. men are becoming like the worst of, of females. Like, mm-hmm. and what I mean by that is men are kind of becoming these, like you see it in the comments, you and I have talked about this kind of whiny, bitchy, you know, just mm-hmm. na- naggy, like it, it, nobody likes to be around that woman, right? Like no <laughs> nobody, one likes no, that. No, no. no. And, but then on the opposite side, then you have women who are masculine, bossy, pushy, demanding, controlling, and nobody wants to be around that type of man. So exactly, <laughs> yeah, it's like we're embodying these two very unattractive qualities in the opposite sexes and it's in it is clashing big time it is and i wanted to ask you because like i said uh i've told my story a hundred times but again i last time i dated was in the 90s i got married 16 years and i'm starting to date in 2016 so i come from an old school type of generation where i'm opening the doors for a woman i'm picking her up opening the passenger side door for her i that's not toxic masculinity that's just southern you know manners in charm. Mm-hmm. And that's just what I am. And that's embedded in me. I'm not going to change that. I don't care how many tweets or how many, you know, TikToks I see with women saying, don't open the door for me. I'm going to do it because that's the way I was raised. And I'm doing it with good intentions. I'm not doing it to prove to you, like you're submissive to me now, walk through the door or anything like that. I'm just, that's just where I come from. And I've never changed that mindset, even when I was dating. And there was a couple of women that uh, commented, you don't have to do that. I'm like, no, I am. Don't worry about it. Come in. Mm-hmm. And I kind of took charge, but I was I didn't take command. So, and that's just my generation. I'm in my mid forties, but the men that are reaching out to you and saying they're confused, are you finding them that they're all ages or just like the younger generation of men who are maybe raised on social media? No, I, I have 40 year olds. I mean, my main, my main audience is, um, I mean, it's different on each platform, but like it's between, you know, 25 and 45 is, is right. I'll get a lot of, and I'll get a lot of men reaching out to me. So what I'll hear from the younger generation is that women in their twenties are just super entitled, um, very 
bitchy and like, you know, kind of the, the worst of what we just talked about. Like they want mm-hmm. six feet, six figures. They want all these things. And like, they're a five, but they want a 10. It's like, they, I get all those comments. <laughs> and yeah. then I get from older men, I get, um, I went out on a date and this woman talked about her ex the whole time and how, you know, just, she's still angry or still bitter or, Mm-hmm. you know or she's got kids and she comes into you, you know the conversations with just like oh you know my ex did this my so it's like they have uber like tons of baggage on this end as they get older mm-hmm. or their expectations are too high and they want this man that just is unrealistic wow so the spread is it's a big spread <laughs> yeah and, and again like i said i've I'm not saying that doesn't exist because it obviously does. And I see it on social media, but I just never encountered that. Uh, I know everybody has physical preferences, whatever they may be. Uh, I've had a couple of women not date me after the first day because I was too short. And I'm like, okay, mm. fine, I'll move on. And I'm like five, nine. So I'm not yeah. short, but I'm like average among men, but I didn't let it get me down. I didn't let it, you know, uh, affect me to where I can't approach any other women. I mean, they're out there, but I just simply move on. Um, and I'm curious where these young men are meeting these women. Are they meeting them on social media or uh, dating apps? Or I'm, I always ask men when they come, you know, when the, the trolls come to my page, I always ask them, are you speaking from real life experience or just re- repeating what you heard on Fresh and Fit? And a lot right. of them don't respond. So I'm curious where these men are coming from. And if they're coming from real life experiences, well, that's one thing. But I think majority of them are just kind of feeding or repeating what they see online. Yeah. And, and that, that, you know, I respect. A lot of people think that I'm a part of like the red pill and I probably should yeah. have thought about my background. I didn't even know what the red <laughs> pill was before I yeah. even got into this, but I, I think it's, I, I just, I, I think it's pretty damaging. Like I feel for men again, because the, the advice that I think is out there, mm-hmm. I, I think it's very surface level. I think it's very shallow. I think it's very, um, you know, giving men permission to have, you know, to, to their sexual dating strategy is having multiple women while the woman just is okay <laughs> with it. Like, I'm like, what, yeah. there is no woman in her right mind that is a healed, respectable clout. A worthy good is, woman. Yeah. That is going to even consider <laughs> that as an option. And like, it's like laughable. Like I literally think it's like laughable when I hear it, mm-hmm. but that is, that is the type of advice that they're gravitating to. And I, and I'm like, okay, you know, this is, and the, it, it fuels me even more mm-hmm. to kind of get good advice out there that this isn't, that we have to have a bridge of understanding. Like if you just think that a woman is going to be submissive to you because you're just the man, mm-hmm. no, like you have to earn your place. You have to earn leadership. You mm-hmm. have to earn respect from on both ends. And a woman you know, I think the natural order of relationship will, will take place. But I talk to good men all the time, mm-hmm. your, yourself included, where I'm sure that there's times when your girlfriend, you know, has to carry you a little bit and has to lead yeah. you a little bit or, or vice versa. Ryan, my friend, Ryan, who talks about, you know, sexless marriages, he's another creator. I mean, he goes, look, like the minute I stopped putting my wife in her place was the, was when she wanted to start having more sex with me because he was like, I was just, I thought I was just being a leader. I thought I was helping her out by giving my unsolicited advice. And he's like, Nope, not going to work with a strong woman, you know? And so I think, <laughs> I think like the, the, the messages that the, the red pill and like the, the fresh and fit, like I have to kind of separate, although I do, I do acknowledge a lot of the things that they say about the women that are out there right now. And that they're, I would, agree. They're, I would, I, they're absolutely, I'm like, absolutely unrealistic expectations. Absolutely. They, we need to have some sort of, you know, awakening for the dating atmosphere. But I, I, I just, I listen to them talk and I, there's a lack of bridge of understanding. They're not giving men any information to take, back to their women and, and like to, to actually take into a relationship, like a right. deep, meaningful, deep relationship. And, and it's just, it's just, you're just going to attract a very broken f- female mm-hmm. and you're going to, you're going to, yeah, you, you might be, be able to control her, but 
that's not a relationship. That's no. a dictate. That's a dictatorship. It, it, you're hot, and I have money. You want my money. I want you as an arm trophy, and that's all it is. And yeah, and, and, and I've heard a lot of Andrew Tate, you know, advice. You know, I hate to bring him up, but uh, I'm yeah. That's another story, but. I listen to his advice to see again, because young men are feeding off of this and you're absolutely right because it is surface level. He's not giving advice on how to keep a, find a good, like a Claire Huxtable or a Dana Scully or a good woman, you know, intelligent, smart woman. He's just telling you how to hook up. Right. And, okay. Take that advice. But what these young men aren't seeing, they're seeing the road ahead, but not the turn. They see the turn, but not the road ahead is what I meant to say. And okay, keep hooking up. But guess what happens? Eventually, you're going to get pregnant. Someone's going to get pregnant. And then what's going to happen? You don't have Andrew Tate money. What's going to happen? You're going to have child support. And then guess what? She was toxic. You weren't. You didn't get, figure each other out. You didn't know what type of woman she was. But now you have a child with this person. And you're yeah. not going to get married. And you're going to live separate. And then before you know it, you have another relationship and go back into that same cycle. Before you know it, you're going to have like three kids from three different women. And it's just a destructive lifestyle. Unless you got Andrew mm -hmm. Tate money and you can afford that. But you, you're not. You're not Andrew Tate. And a lot of these guys no. think they are. And they're, no. they're feeding them yeah. a delusion is what they're doing. Well, and, and not to mention from a personal standpoint, as a woman, the, the, what he, what that whole, again, this whole menosphere talks about, right. Yeah. With women who are above 35, like they might as well just be like a, like wasted space. Yeah. And I mean, I come from the Silicon, like I came from Silicon Valley. I came from San Francisco where women are, having their first child at 45 <laughs> like yeah. they were busy building their careers and so i i just like laugh because i'm like is that maybe that, that's <laughs> what happens in like miami dade or like like florida like maybe that's the the type of atmosphere but like women all over the west coast have been working on their careers mm -hmm. wait wait have children later the, the kids are perfectly fine they come out great um, you know, there's, there's, there's a maturity that comes with women in their thirties. There's a, you know, th there is a, just uh, me, myself and my, my personal experience. Like I'm a different person than I was in my twenties. I'm a, mm -hmm. a, a completely different person and I know how to take care of a man. I tell you what, I know a lot about men now. And I, <laughs> and the, the man that I end up with is going to be treated like a freaking King because he's going to treat yeah. me like a queen, but you know, so I just, I have a really hard time with the message. I have a really hard time with what they're, what they're doing for men and the giving this just this toxic advice. And I, I just, I can't associate myself with it. And I have to be very clear with people that my audience that, you know, this is, this is different. This is, the, don't let the red background fool you because yeah. I'm not going to participate in demeaning woman and, 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 and Andrew Tate, I mean, he's just, he's a piece of shit and I'm just, we're just, let's <laughs> yeah. just say it like what it is. And I, yeah, this whole top G thing is just such a, like, uh, it's very confusing. And, and it's sad because in other cultures, there is a reverence for women. There is a reverence, especially yes. for, for older women. And like in the Latino community, my grandmother was viewed as a freaking legend. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she was the midwife. Oh yeah. You know, she, she knew all about the pregnancies. She had the medicines. She knew what to give women when they were cramping from periods and hormones, like old in Greek, Greek, Greek as well. Like the women who are older have this, just this respect. And mm -hmm. I just can't, I cannot, it's not my culture, man. And I'm yeah. sure you as well. Like women who are older had, they just, they, they command respect. So they were always a cornerstone of the family and any holiday, we all went to grandma's house. She was like, like the queen, so to speak. The yeah. queen, the queen. Yeah. yeah. And you were raised like a, as a Hispanic, you were raised to, you know, respect women, of course, but never to, uh, you know, hit them or do anything belittling to them, but also gain respect as well. So it was like a mutual respect. And it was also mm -hmm. roles within the Hispanic culture. Like growing up, I was always right. taught this is man's work and I would be outside either fixing cars, doing grass, doing something with my hands or helping my dad with the garden while my, my sister was raised to clean the house. And I know mm -hmm. roles nowadays are not a popular thing to say, but that's just how we were brought up. So yeah, culturally it's different. Uh, it doesn't mean it's demeaning, but that's just how, it, what we valued and what we did. Yeah. And, 
again, roles are not, I think roles are good. I think in yeah. relationships, like it's okay to have not necessarily like traditional gender roles, but right. it's good. It's, it's okay to negotiate these things back and forth. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how you and your, your girlfriend do it or partner do it. Um, but yeah, it's like, if you don't want to do the laundry, then fine, go do the yard work. <laughs> like it's, it's just, yeah, that's just a part. That's a partnership, right? Like for me yeah. and my job, I hate doing Excel spreadsheets. I hate that. Oh, I hate Excel. <laughs> I hate it myself. So, so yeah. So it's like I ask, I ask my coworker, you know, hey, can you help me out here? And like, we we need to look at relationships as like what they truly are, which is like a working a partnership. partnership. Yeah. Right. And like, if you don't want to do something, then like, how can I take that burden off of you and vice versa? That's just, mm-hmm. that's healthy standards, in my opinion. I agree. And it, like you said, every relationship is different. So it's not really traditional roles, but it's like, what are you great at doing? And mm-hmm. it's just having that dialogue. Uh, like, for example, you want to hear something? Uh, when I first got married, I, for whatever reason, love washing dishes. I just loved it because I never did it. So, hey, I'm washing dishes. I just loved it. So I had my grandma and my mom at a dinner when I got married at our first house. But this is back in, oh my God, 2001. Anyway, after the dinner, I picked up the plates and started taking them to the kitchen. My grandma just got pissed and she goes why isn't your wife doing that i'm like no grandma i'm gonna do it but she's yelling at in spanish and i'm like no i got it my grandma and she it just became a big thing and i told her no mm. i'm gonna do it don't worry about it you know she's my wife you know we all we work this out it does not be little to me i just it's my role and i want to do it and it was just one of these weird things where the culture clash i saw mm-hmm. it firsthand and it's like again she wasn't she was telling me to do it and it wasn't that i was in a woman role it was just i liked doing it yeah. <laughs> it's and, so that's, weird. and that's, that's okay. Like from a generational standpoint as well, like men didn't cook and, yeah. you know, I went over to my girlfriend's house the other day and she's happily married and her husband comes home from work and does all of like the meal prepping while yeah. she gets the kids from school. Like there's, the, they have this, this synergy where she'll do the mm-hmm. breakfasts and he'll, and he takes care of dinner. And like, yeah. That's just the way that it is. And and it works for them. And I think that that's, you know, again, advice that, and I, I love, I, I love a lot of men in this space, but I think that like that's, I think that's misguided advice that, I you know, know, if your woman isn't, oh, your woman's, if she doesn't make the bed for you <laughs> and she's not a, a real woman, I'm like, no. <laughs> yeah. I just <laughs> laugh at that. It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's really um, shallow. But real quick, I want to talk about your YouTube channel because you just started this, what, a couple months ago? and mm, uh, A month ago, yeah. Yeah, you're doing great. You have over a thousand subscribers already. And uh, as again, for everybody listening, uh, I, I was, I've been watching your videos for quite some time, but I saw a video the other day and I want to bring this up because it's got a catchy title. It's like, how to make w- 10 ways to make a woman wet. And I'm like, ooh, okay, I want to check this out. So <laughs> great job on the title and the thumbnails. So let's talk about this. Like, um, Getting a woman wet, and it sounds weird just saying that out loud, but like, uh, you find a lot of men ha- have confusion in this or like a needed assistance with just kind of breaking down how to go about doing this process. Cause truthfully, I have my ways they've worked, you know, with years of mm-hmm. research and data, you know, I, and I'm going to share my tips, but from you, like, is this coming practical, from like me? Practical, practical yeah. experience, right? Yeah, exactly. Practical experience, <laughs> you know, and I, you know, I really took, you know, I had, I had, had, had a good time. That's what I want to say. <laughs> Copious, copious notes, copious, copious notes. notes. Yes. Uh, but for the men out there, do you find like this is something that they're really, uh, there's a lack of knowledge of, and they just truthfully don't know. Um, I would say it's probably half. Yeah, it's probably half and half. I think that men, I, I am always surprised at <laughs> the reactions that I get from men from uh-huh. some of my videos. Cause I, I would think like, Oh, this is common knowledge, but I think, I think men struggle because they're not getting laid or they're not, you know, they're, yeah, I think they're turning off women or women because it, it, women are very, um, you know, it's the little things that, that add up for us. Uh, Mm -hmm. we're not, we're not easy to crack the code. So it's, it's like these, it's, it's like little tiny things that you have to do to like unwrap the wrapper. You can't just like yeah. <laughs> unwrap it. And it's like, Oh, <laughs> surprise. <laughs> men, that's men. Like, yeah. Oh, just take your clothes off and let's go. Like that's go. literally, that's how simple it is with men. But with women, I just feel that they are, 
you know, there, if you, if you say one wrong thing, or if you, you know, if you come at us in a certain way, it like it can trigger something and then we can shut down. And so it's not that, it's not that men don't necessarily know it's that women are just a little bit more unpredictable than mm-hmm. men. So I wanted to make a splash because I thought, well, let me just, I, I, I don't know. I mean, hey, my, nice. <laughs> <laughs> ding, ding. Ding, ding. My YouTube is obviously new. I I'm, I'm trying to kind of understand like, and I, and I have plenty of other ones that are planned, but I thought, let me kind of see what the reception is with this one. And, and those are the things that have worked on me. Mm-hmm. Um, in regards to the things that I talked about. So I don't know. What do you think? What What's your, you tell me what your things have been. And, we'll, <laughs> and, and I want to hear, so I want to like have, a, I have never heard these before, yes. people that are listening. So yeah, I'll, I'll be able to tell you. Um, this is a genuine live reaction here. So, uh, but yeah. I won't say all, you have 10 points and I'm not going to, you know, say them on the, on the podcast. Cause again, guess what guys go to her channel and watch it and leave a comment because they're good. Uh, but there's a some that I want to touch on that I kind of collaborate with mine. So let me go to my list real quick. Mm-hmm. You mentioned make them laugh. Yes. Making mm-hmm. a woman laugh is critical. And that's one thing I had. With a, if I'm with anybody, I'm just very fun. I don't care who you are, how pretty you are. I'm just going to make you laugh and just I'm very humble. Sometimes I poke fun at myself sometimes. But making a woman laugh is you have to do that. That's one part of it. So mm-hmm. again, that collaborates with your list. Uh, the other one I have is... Be confident Mm -hmm. in yourself and be comfortable in your own skin and be aware of your strengths. That's all kind of one bullet point. Um, Well, the other one I have, you mentioned kisser. You have to be a great kisser and know how to kiss. Know when to go firm. You know when to go firm and when to be soft. And a lot of guys, there's a lot of women don't know how to kiss either. Oh, trust me. I can tell if somebody's emotionally available or not by the way they kiss. Like it is, Mm -hmm. some people are just the worst. And it is. It's, it, it's an immediate, it's an immediate game changer. I had this one woman, I remember we went out and we were about to, we we're going to start kissing and I lean in and she literally just sticks her tongue out at me. And I'm like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I went in, it was the most awkward kiss I've ever had. I'm like, what is she doing? She just thought kissing was sticking your tongue out. Well, the and I think thing? It's <laughs> weird, I've had, I've had, I call it lizard tongue where I've had guys. <laughs> Sorry. You know what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, I'm like, what is that? Like, what that, that that's not it's the weirdest thing. But yeah, and it's it's funny because I think, wow, like you made it to 45 years old and like nobody like I've I've given instruction. Like <gasps> no, you have the, not. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like men, I mean, at least if they're open to it, like I appreciate that because it tells me that, like, oh, like they actually want to learn how to kiss me. Mm-hmm. But I have literally sat on the couch and I'm like, go. No, no, don't do that. D- do this. Like, and I have I have flat out given that is so sad a master class on kissing. Cause I I'd like to think that I know. I mean, I I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm a good kisser, like I've been told. And so you you learn, you just know. You just know. You just know. After like, a while. And I don't, not to toot my own horn either, but I consider myself a Jedi in, in kissing because I love kissing. And get this, there's Me one too. move I, I'm going to share a move with you. One move I did that I didn't know that women loved because I grew up watching movies. And I noticed in Superman 2, whenever Clark Kent kissed Lois, he put his hands on her cheeks and he ah. just, and he leaned in and kissed her. So I remember whenever I would lean in, I do this. And just put my hands around her cheeks and or her, not her neck. How can I describe it? But just like yeah, this. I know. Yeah. And I'd reach in and I kiss. And when I did that, they would always mm, they, they'd react <laughs> like yeah. no one's ever done that. And it worked for me. And again, yeah. you, you have to learn how to be soft and also firm whenever the moment is appropriate. Yes. So that's, that that's the hand great, move. That's great. That's great advice. No, that's that's great advice. That's, thank you. And don't just just don't just like go in for the jugular, you know, like take your time. Mm-hmm. Don't just like stick your tongue down our throat. It, it's and, just, it's a very, and, and the biting of the lip and like the, yes, the sucking of the bottom know, of the lip, yep. like pulling and pulling, like pulling and pushing. And like, it's very intricate, but find a woman who, if you're listening, find a woman who will teach you how to kiss. They're out there. <laughs> We're out there. We will help you. Yes. Yes. And have a great smile. That's mm-hmm. one thing that I noticed, but the, 
the most important thing that every woman I dated told me, and I found it an odd compliment is like, you make me feel safe. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what? So and again, bad. I haven't dated in since the nineties. So when I first heard it, I'm like, what do you mean by that? She's oh, most guys, they're either angry at their ex. So as a woman, we're scared because he's drinking and we don't know whether he's going to just blow up and he's taking me home. Is he going to be mad and take it out on me? They brought up all these situations. Like I never thought of as a mm-hmm. man. And I'm like, okay. So uh, plus you weren't too sexual. You were just fun. You, you had a calming peace about you. You weren't angry with the world. You love what you did. All these things that I didn't know were just natural to me, but really helped me in the dating world because I had a plan, you know, I wasn't needy, but they love that. And oh, making them feel talk- safe. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I can't say enough about that. I I, I have to stop because okay. <laughs> I've had men who I've had men who have sent me like lo- links to like lingerie, right? When we just first started dating. And I'm like I'm serious. I, I'm like, what did you wow. just do? Like, I, I, and it's one, it's just, it's knowing what is appropriate, but overtly, overtly sexualizing a woman, you, you might as well just shut the door on her vagina because right. you've just made her feel <laughs> like she is an object and she is, it's like, be smarter men. Um, we don't, we don't want dick pics. We don't want, I'll we, never don't res- that. we don't respond visually. We respond through our ears. And yes, I mean, again, I, I've had I've dated great guys, but like they, they think like you can tell, <laughs> you can see, <laughs> you can see the toxicity from like a mile away. Like you can mm-hmm. see it. And and it's like, if guys just understood that a woman's primary instinct for her to want to sleep with you is to feel safe. And mm-hmm. I'm not saying men need, again, I have all this knowledge about men. I have to be responsible about not using it to manipulate men. It's my responsibility to understand that like, yes, I know all this, I know all this now about men, but if I use it for bad, that, that makes me a demon. Like that makes me even more evil than the evilest of women. So Mm -hmm. take the information and take the information, understand it, but understand that like women do want to feel safe and we, we are bombarded by sexual images. We are bombarded by men who want to sleep with us especially if she's anywhere near attractive if she's a five or up that's all she hears every day she's getting hit on she's Mm -hmm. getting she's getting messages that you know she's she's dealing with her own insecurities like all she wants is a man to say you know i really enjoy talking with you i think you are just so intelligent so well spoken and i want to spend more time with you getting to know you and it's like oh it's Mm -hmm. such a breath of fresh air because Again, I just, I I think that men are missing the fact that like, wait till you get her. She'll be a freak in the sheets. Yeah. (laughs) If you just wait, like just give her time to open up and that side of her will come out. Mm -hmm. Trust me. Like naturally it will come out. I'm sure that, I don't know what you think about that, but no, if you come... You come in for the jugular, she's down, she's shutting down. No, I, I never did that because, again, um, I found out, and again, I'm being truthful as a man here, I couldn't just fuck anybody. I was, mm-hmm. I'm not wired that way. There has to be an emotional connection, not love, but there has to be a chemical connection between me and this person for me mm-hmm. to function, quote unquote. I just, I'm not like these other guys who could just put it in whatever. I don't know how right. they can do that. There's something wrong with them, but I think for, uh, a lot of men, like you said, the reason they're aggressive, I think a lot of us, like I said, we mentioned earlier, we learn the wrong way. We watch a lot of guys watch porn, which is detrimental to relationships with women because they see that they think that's a reality. They think to get a woman wet or whatever is do these moves that they saw in a video growing up. And that's so far from the truth. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's just fiction. That's just a movie. It's not reality. And I think a fiction. lot of men they take that into the real world and they're impatient. They don't know how to have that communication because most movies and porn start right at the scene without any right. dialogue. So I think that's, a, that's a huge influence. I think that's a huge, for, truthfully from a man, that's a huge influence. And uh, there's mm-hmm. other men that I've hung out with that speak to that. Men idolize porn stars, which 
is stupid because I get their beauty. I get their great in bed, but I don't know a damn thing about them. If they're good talk women about, or not. Talk about daddy issues. I mean, exactly. yeah, like it's <laughs> porn stars are, are known for having, you know, um, uh, poor male influences in their life. Yeah. Um, and you, you go into sex work for, for just so much love and validation. And after, after my experience and, and going into, again, like the treatment facility and understanding mm-hmm. like why I was trying to get validation from men and what, what, what that was, what that was doing for me, I learned, I had, I had girlfriends who were on, you know, like sugar daddy sites who were on these particular, you know, just that doing like sex work. I mean, a lot of, there was a lot of sex workers that were a part of this treatment facility that I was in. And, and once wow. you see, once you see that, and once you see the dysfunction behind it, like mm-hmm. I was like, I can never look at porn again. Like I, I like it, it like kind of fucked with my head because I mm-hmm. was, I just think like these women, very few of them are going into it with just like, sure. I just enjoy sex. Like that's, it's like, yeah. No, there. there t- it takes a very special uh, person to to kind of go into that, and I. There's no judgment. It's just that I know how broken I was, and I and I see it, and my heart just wants to like help. I just want to like help them because yeah. I know. I don't know. It, it serves a purpose. I get it. It's an industry. People make money, but for me, wow. I I think that's why a lot of people are going like the no fop way, you know, because they're seeing that it's, it can be, it can be really destructive. It really can. Uh, a couple more things before we, uh, end the podcast, you said safe. And I think a lot of men, they get confused with that word. Like a woman wants to feel safe around you. A lot of guys I know for a fact think, okay, that means I got to be big, muscular and know that no man's going to approach us or harm her in any way. That's how a lot of them think instead of no, she wants to feel safe from you. Yep. (laughs) And I think yep. that's a big uh, thing that men need to be aware of. So, but that's how men think. We're very protective yeah. in, in our, it's in our DNA, but that's how we don't really think about the other at ourselves. And I think there'd be a lot of better men out there if we took times to really work on ourselves. Because again, mm-hmm. there's pain out there. We've all been hurt by the opposite sex or somebody we love, but having that self-reflection, looking inward and say, Hey, what can I do to avoid being in the situation again? Like you and I did like going to therapy and, you know, getting help. I think right. there'd be, that would really help them out as well. 100%. We want, we, we are, we think that you're going to hurt us. Like women mm-hmm. just automatically kind of think, you know, in our heads, we're thinking, okay, what does he want from us? He just wants to sleep with us. Right. He just like, and then after that, I'm going to be, be discarded or whatever. So a woman for her to feel safe is yes. Like, don't talk about your ex that poorly. Please don't. She's, um, um, automatically, she's <laughs> yes. going to think like, well, I'm going to be the next, I'm going to be the next ex that's mm-hmm. that's on the chopping block. You know, it's like, heal yourself, you know, show up good to society, show up as a healed man. And, and like, that's, and that's what I, that's what I will say about the red pill that I do like Rolo Tomasi, you know, on some of these guys that talk about, you know, a man on his purpose is the most attractive thing because it's true. A man, a man like yourself who, you know, has purpose, has drive, who's doing good in the world, who doesn't view women as objects. um, That translates to, it's somebody again, like yourself, who's had a a potential history of infidelity. I dated a guy who, uh, I don't know how many times he cheated. I, we didn't even get there. Like it was, but, but it was, Yes, he took responsibility, but then there was always like, well, this is why I did this. Or the woman, like Mm -hmm. this woman did this, like this, like he always had an excuse for the behavior. And, and that, again, that does not make me want to get into a relationship with you because Mm -hmm. that tells me then that's what's going to prevent you from cheating on me. Right. What's going to, what's like, if you're, if you're not, if you're not able to take responsibility and say, this is what I need in a relationship. This is how I've learned. This is how I've grown. I'm not going to do this again because I value fidelity and like all the things that you've come to. And I've watched what you've said on your videos about Mm -hmm. what you've learned about your experience. Mm -hmm. I don't think that you would cheat again. Just, just knowing what I've seen in the tiny short videos that I've seen (laughs) of you. It's like, this man has self-reflected. He has learned from his mistakes. He understands how to communicate his wants and needs now. And there is like this, 
that right there is like the sexiest thing. And then, then just, if you're listening, please understand that. Like that is so sexy when a man who is self-aware and, and knows the mistakes that he's made. Guys take notes, take notes. She knows <laughs> what she's talking about. And one last question, Sarah, what is the biggest lesson you've learned being an influencer on TikTok? <laughs> oh. <laughs> because think about it I, the reason i'm asking that because you and i we had no i think before this happened whatever happened how we got here we didn't have plans to be on tiktok or to maybe share our stories and help people it all happened through a perfect storm of events but here you are you are impacting men's lives and people's lives and you know making a, a positive difference but in this short span not even a year what's the biggest lesson you've learned you know, you have to realize that TikTok and all these other social media platforms is a vacuum and it's not reality sometimes. Sometimes you read the comments and you take all this in and you think, is our world really this messed up? And you have to protect yourself and your mental health and not get wrapped up in this swirl of, of negative feedback and what people are saying and the criticism that you get. Like for me, the biggest thing is I, I have a mission statement. It's on my bathroom wall. I look at it every day. I will not let comments from men, from women, from anybody deter me from that mission statement, mm -hmm. you know, to help women to, or to help men, you know, pro provide provide advocacy for men to be a voice to them. I get comments from men and women that are, you know, that tear me down on each level, but it's all about taking yourself out of this vacuum of social media and remembering like, I do have a right in this space. I have put in the work I have done. I have done the deep work to, to be able to provide advice and um, I will not let anyone deter me. And, and not be influenced by likes. Not be, I went through yeah. a, a whole roller coaster of like, oh gosh, this video got zero. What do I need to do? What do I need to say to, for this video? You know, it's like I blew up very fast, but I started realizing that like I was chasing likes and mm -hmm. that, that is, that gets really old and I got burnt out and I had, and I've taken a little bit of a break from TikTok because of that reason. I'll be getting back on here soon. Mm -hmm. It's been, you know, it's been about a month since I've really like gone at it because I needed to take some time to really get back on my, my mission. Um, I think being a creator is hard, as you know, it's, it's not as easy as people think it is. It's not like you're just posting videos and then, right? no, it's, there's a lot of work that goes into it. So I would say just protect your mental health and remember that there's a life outside of social media. Mm-hmm. You can definitely yeah, lose like, yourself in this whole yeah. space. As much as like, I love my internet friends and I love the conversations that we have. I have to remember that, you know, go make like real friends and <laughs> go, <Exactly. laughs> go have like real, go have like real experiences outside of, of this whole thing that we awesome. call social media. Exactly. Well, again, Sarah, you are the first guest I've had. Um, I have on my new podcast. So I want to thank you for being the first guest. And uh, where can people find you? Sarah Don Moore on all places: YouTube, Instagram, <clears throat> TikTok, Twitter. I'm all there. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thanks, Rudy. Bye. Look forward to more. <laughs> Bye.